privacy isn't dead, but privacy is under serious assault. And I think it's uh, sort of a war of attrition. It's like uh, boiling the frog. You know, you say you turn up the temperature slowly, and then one moment the frog doesn't realize how hot it is, the frog dies. And privacy is a little bit like that, where we're trading away privacy for convenience. And sometimes that's a good trade. People are fine with that trade. And then sometimes you're making that trade, and you're unaware you're doing it. So most consumers don't understand the privacy trade-offs when they browse the web. The data that's being collected about them, the analytics that are being run against their bind behavior, um, it's invisible. And it's behind the scenes. And so it's uh, very difficult for a consumer to make an informed decision. You know, is getting two cents off or this predictive advertisement, is that worth what I'm trading away? And it's sort of that insidious nature that disturbs me. Um, the other thing is we're seeing on the privacy front is this concept of the right to be forgotten. And essentially, when I started, um, hard drives were expensive. And data could not be kept for very long, because it was just expensive to keep. Well, now, essentially, storage is free. So anything that you can do, or anything your children do, essentially will be around forever now. And so we've kind of crossed this threshold of data forever. And then that opens up a whole can of worms of who has access to that data, uh, who can use it for what purpose. Yeah, that, that there's this fallacy that, that if you don't have anything to hide, you know, why don't you just invite the police into your house every day? Um, and it, it's, the, the problem is it's maybe not for you, but it might impact other people. So you might be one actor in society, but it might have negative impact by setting a precedent for everybody else. Um, and the problem is it's not like you get to give away your privacy or your security until the moment you absolutely want it back. It's a sort of once it's gone, it's gone. It's very difficult to get back. I'd say there's just an inherent tension between cybersecurity and personal privacy. Because the tools that security uh, experts need to defend their networks are the same tools that could be used uh, to attack privacy. So there's been a lot of debate around the concept of deep packet inspection. Well, anybody that runs a network has been using deep packet inspection before it was called DPI. You have to. If you don't use those tools, you can't get your work done. The network won't work. Uh, you can't debug when there's a problem. The difference is now that those tools are being used for other things. Instead of inspecting the packets to look for problems to correct on the network and the network flows, they're being used to look for content and then maybe make some decisions. Well, if it's an email from this customer, go here. If it's an advertisement from that customer, go there. Um, that's not what it was originally intended for. And so we, it's not practical to ask the experts, well, stop developing and using your tools because they might be misappropriated. I, that genie is out of the bottle. Um, so I think it's, it just points to ever vigilance. You know, the price of an open internet is ever vigilance um, to, to misuse of the technology, just like uh, you know, the, the price of a democracy is ever vigilance. I am concerned about the amount of data collected on mobile users. Um, I'm not so concerned about maybe their shopping habits. I'm more concerned down the road. So for example, if you think of a mobile phone as a tracking device um, that happens to make phone calls, um, and you store that data long enough, the, whoever controls that data will be able to figure out that us, are, we're sitting in a room right now. And we sat in a room for half an hour, let's say. And then I walked into a meeting, and who was in the meeting? And they'll be able to place me with everybody I've interacted with for how long. Uh, well, a year from now, they can come back and they can say, you know, you were in a meeting with Joe. And we found out Joe was a bad guy. And you seem to talk to Joe a lot. Um, so you know, what did you and Joe talk about? It's sort of a guilt by association. Um, retroactively, forever. For every person I've ever stood next to on the bus, potentially. It could also be used for good. It could be, well, a, a lady was mugged on that corner, and you were standing near the corner. Did you see the person who attacked the lady? And so it's this sort of dual use of the technology that worries me, because it'll be very seductive to say, well, we need to do it to save the lady that's been mugged. And to do that, we just need to keep the data forever. And then down the road, it could be used you know, for a lot of unintended consequences. And, um, and we're not having these debates publicly. And consumers are not making that trade-off. They're not saying, OK, I'm willing to be tracked forever for all these future purposes. But in the other hand, I really like making phone calls. Um, what we do is we end up saying, I like the phone calls, and I'll worry about all the other stuff later. Um, so I'm just, I'm just waiting to see what big data will do with all of our location data. The, the technology exists for a surveillance nation. It's just part of the infrastructure now. 
Um, so it really comes to the intent of the operators. So if the operators are trying to monetize, they might try to put more predictive advertisements in front of you because they know what you like, because they've been watching you. Now, maybe not watching you in person, but they've been watching your behavior and computer algorithms determine that you like to go to dog sites, so maybe they'll try to sell you some dog food or something. No human was ever involved in that uh, trend, that pitch to sell you dog food. Computers were the only ones involved based on your past behavior. Um, but there's a very fine line between that and saying, well, he also goes to a political site that likes to talk about Marxism. And uh, Marxism is bad this week, so we need to identify all the people, you know, that. Now, whether or not you're a professor teaching political science and you go to a Marxist site to see what they're talking about or you actually truly are a Marxist, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that this, this technology infrastructure will enable. And in the hands of, of a good government, it's incredibly empowering. In the hands of a bad government, it's in incredibly stifling. And so it all comes down to who's using the technology. Um, and then I would argue you really need strong civilian oversight or at least allow the civilians to understand what's going on so they can make informed decisions. And, and at this point, I, I don't believe that the citizens are informed enough to, to be able to really participate in that dialogue. Yeah, digital arms trades have, have existed before we had the term for them, uh, before we called them an underground market, a gray market, a black market for vulnerabilities. Um, in the early days, when there was nothing of value really on the internet, yet there were still vulnerabilities, zero days we'll call them, um, the hackers traded them amongst each other. And it was more like, uh, well, what do you have? Well, I've got a vulnerability in this FTP server. What do you have? Well, I've got something in this Archie server. Well, let's trade. I want to see what you found, and I'll show you what I found, and we'll learn from each other. Well, all of a sudden, now we've got websites online. We've got commerce. We've got ways to make money. And all of a sudden, criminals get involved. Now there's something to monetize online. And, uh, and if the criminals uh, don't necessarily know how to get the vulnerabilities themselves, they'll say they'll pay for them. They'll create a marketplace. And so what we see is we see multiple marketplaces. We see sort of legitimate governments that are trying to buy vulnerabilities from researchers. We see organized crime trying to buy uh, exploits. We see people in massively multiplayer online games trying to buy vulnerabilities and exploits so they can get more gold in whatever game they're playing. Um, we'll see competitors of one company buying exploits in a product of the other company to try to discredit them or use against them. So uh, it's not as neatly summed up as like a single marketplace. There's you know, many marketplaces and the motivations of the people buying and selling are quite different sometimes. People think that the, the perfection, you know, it's sort of like the quest for perfection against the good enough. Um, where a lot of these things we're facing online, I think it's an incremental change that's going to have to happen. I think a lot of people want a paradigm shift all at once. And I think in reality, it's like, no, it's going to be a lot of hard work. It's going to take a long time. And it's going to be one foot in front of the other, making incremental changes. And that's discouraging to some people. But that's the way it's always worked online. And other people, I think, they want to just have, we'll have a decree. We'll have a new pronouncement. And then everything will change. And I don't see that happening. And so I think there's a lot of energy spent trying to find the perfect solution and then appeasing everybody versus that, no, it's not going to be very glamorous. It's not going to be a big climactic scene at the end of the movie. It's going to be bit by bit by bit. I mean, my problem with, with the term cyber war is it's not specific enough and it evokes the concept of war, uh, where in reality what we're seeing online is, is not war. Um, and if we did see it, we would, we would know it when we saw it, in the sense that there'd be large impacts and large bits of the infrastructure would go down. Um, but that would be uh, precipitating real conflict.